Okay, hello, this is video lecture number 25. Uh, today we are looking at the War of 1812 and the transformation of politics. So during the presidential campaign of 1800, Federalists and Republicans alike argued that the very survival of the Republic itself was at issue. Uh, Federalists charged that the Jeffersonians were demagogues intent on transporting the excesses of the French Revolution to America while Republicans countered that their opponents were monarchists uh, and avowed uh, enemies of popular sovereignty. Uh, given the ideological context of the times, the political crisis of the 1790s, uh, the newness of the American experiment in republicanism, uh, and the absence of the idea of a loyal opposition, uh, protagonists on each side were not simply mouthing political propaganda. Uh, they earnestly believed what they said. Uh, hence, Jefferson insisted that his electoral victory was as real a revolution in the principles of our government as that of 1776 was in its form. Federalists, however, were alarmed, and John Adams tried to salvage the situation through a series of lame duck judicial appointments. Uh, Jefferson, stung by these midnight appointments uh, and determined to undo the harm caused by Adams, uh, ordered a halt to the delivery of the commissions to these judges. The result was a landmark Supreme Court case. Uh, in his inaugural address, uh, Jefferson spoke of an American empire uh, with room enough for our descendants to the, to the thousandth and thousandth generation. Clearly, he was not alluding to the United States as it stood in 1801. Uh, the chosen country he envisioned encompassed all America, North and South. The Louisiana Purchase in 1803 fell squarely in line with this expansive vision of an empire of liberty, and Jefferson, eager to assert American control over the territory, commissioned Meriwether Lewis and William Clark to explore the new domain, uh, to collect ethnographic information, and to establish commercial and political relations with its Indian populations. While the Louisiana Purchase removed an immediate threat to the Jeffersonian policy, uh, the resumption of hostilities between Great Britain and France in 1803 posed even greater problems. Both belligerents refused to honor the neutrality of the United States and began to seize American vessels uh, entering hostile waters. Jefferson who believed in the power of commercial diplomacy, uh, that is, using American commerce as a weapon in settling international affairs, uh, imposed a trade embargo in 1807. Rather than gaining the ends Jefferson sought, however, the embargo resulted only in economic dislocation uh, and the rejuvenation of the moribund Federalist Party. Uh, in addition to Coping with the effects of the failed embargo, uh, James Madison, Jefferson's successor, had to deal with the increasingly hostile Creeks in the Southeast and the Western Confederacy, uh, led by the Shawnee Tecumseh uh, and his brother. These tensions uh, with the British on the high seas and uh, with the Indians in the West uh, culminated in the War of 1812. In general, uh, the war went poorly for the United States uh, and, and New England Federalists uh, who had opposed the war from the outset. Uh, they were determined to be hurt. Uh, meeting in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, 26 delegates from Massachusetts, uh, Connecticut and uh, uh, Rhode Island and four counties in New Hampshire and Vermont drafted a set of revolution, uh, I'm sorry, of resolutions to present in Washington. Unfortunately for the Hartford delegation, uh, the timing of their arrival in the nation's capital could not have been worse. News of the Treaty of Ghent ending the war and reports of a stunning American victory in the Battle of New Orleans uh, preceded them. Although the treaty addressed none of the substantive uh, issues that had led to war in the first place, and although the action at New Orleans came two weeks after the Ghent Treaty, uh, and therefore play no role whatsoever in ending the war, uh, the Federalists never recovered uh, from charges of sedition and treason 
that came to be associated with the Hartford Convention. In the 1816 elections, the Federalist Party was in disarray. By 1820, it had disappeared. So let's take a closer look at this stuff, uh, the War of 1812 and the transformation of politics, uh, starting with our examination of the conflict in the Atlantic and the West. As the Napoleonic Wars ravaged Europe, Great Britain and France refused to respect the neutrality of American merchant vessels. Napoleon imposed the Continental System, uh, which required customs officials to seize American ships that had stopped in Britain. The British naval blockade uh, stopped American ships carrying goods to Europe uh, and also searched them for British deserters who were then uh, impressed, uh, which means being forced, back into service in the Royal Navy. Americans were outraged uh, in 1807 then when a British warship attacked the American ship, the Chesapeake, uh, killing or wounding 21 men and seizing four. Jefferson then devised the Embargo Act of 1807, uh, which prohibited American ships from leaving their home ports until Britain and France repealed their restrictions on U.S. trade. The act caused American exports to plunge, prompting Federalists to demand its repeal. Despite discontent over the embargo, voters elected Republican James Madison to the presidency in 1808. Uh, as president, James Madison replaced the embargo with new economic restrictions, none of which persuaded Britain and France to respect America's neutrality rights. Republican congressmen, uh, then from the West, thought Britain was the major offender, as evidenced by its assistance to the Indians in the Ohio River Valley. Republican expansionists in Congress condemned British support of Tecumseh uh, and his brother, uh, who had revived the Western Confederacy and threatened to invade Canada in retaliation. In 1811, then, uh, following a series of clashes between the settlers and the Western Confederacy, uh, a man named William Henry Harrison, uh, then the governor of the Indiana Territory, led an army uh, against Indians in the village of Prophetstown, fended off the Confederacy's warriors at the Battle of Tippecanoe, uh, and he, then he burned the village to the ground. Henry Clay and John C. Calhoun, uh, hoping to gain new territory and discredit the Federalists, pushed Madison uh, into war with Great Britain. With elections approaching, Madison demanded British respect for American sovereignty in the West and neutral rights on the Atlantic. When the British didn't respond quickly enough, he asked Congress for a declaration of war. In June of 1812, a sharply divided Senate voted 19 to 13 in favor of war, uh, and the House of Representatives concurred with a vote of 79 to 49. So let's move on to the War of 1812. This war was a near disaster for the United States, both militarily and politically. Uh, political divisions in the United States prevented a major invasion of Canada uh, in the East. Uh, New Englanders opposed the war, and Boston merchants declined to lend money to the government. Uh, after two years of sporadic warfare, the United States had made little progress along the Canadian frontier uh, and was on the defensive along the Atlantic. Uh, moreover, the new capital city in Washington, D.C., was in ruins. In the Southwest, a man named Andrew Jackson led an army of militiamen to victory over British-supported Creek Indians uh, in the Battle of Horseshoe Bend uh, and forced the Indians to cede 23 million acres of land. Federalists then met in Hartford, Connecticut to discuss a strategy for a radical reform in the National Compact. Though some proposed secession, uh, the majority wanted an amendment to the Constitution that would limit presidents to a single four-year term and rotate the presidency among citizens of different states. Uh, at the convention, they also suggested amendments restricting commercial embargoes and requiring a two-thirds majority in Congress to do things like declare war, uh, prohibit trade, or admit a new state to the Union. 
the war continued to go badly. Uh, an American naval victory on Lake Champlain uh, narrowly averted a British invasion of the Hudson River Valley, uh, and British troops landed outside New Orleans and threatened to cut American trade down the Mississippi River. American military setbacks strengthened this growing opposition to the war. Uh, but fortunately, Britain, uh, tired from its 20-year war with France, uh, wanted peace. And the Treaty of Ghent, signed December 24th of 1814, restored the pre-war borders of the United States. Now, Andrew Jackson's victory uh, against the British at New Orleans not only made Jackson a national hero, uh, but also redeemed the nation's pride and, together with the coming of peace, undercut the Hartford Convention's demands for a significant revision of the Constitution. Uh, as a result of John Quincy Adams' uh, diplomacy, uh, the United States gained undisputed possession of nearly all the land south of the 49th parallel and between the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains. It was also at Adams's urging uh, that uh, James Monroe announcing a new, uh, announced a new American foreign policy called the Monroe Policy, uh, the Monroe Doctrine, which uh, declared that the American continents were not subject for further colonization. Uh, in return, the United States agreed not to interfere in the internal concerns of European nations. All right, so let's look at the last section, the Federalist Legacy. The War of 1812 ushered in a new phase of the Republican political revolution. Before the conflict, Federalists had strongly supported Alexander Hamilton's program of national mercantilism. Uh, after the war, the Republicans then split into two factions, National Republicans and the Jeffersonian Republicans. Henry Clay led the National Republicans. In 1816, Republican Henry Clay of Kentucky sponsored legislation that created the Second Bank of the United States, and he persuaded President Monroe to sign it. Meanwhile, uh, the Federalist Party was in severe decline. Nationalist Republicans had won the allegiance of many Federalist voters in the East, and the pro-farmer policies of Jeffersonian Republicans maintained their party's dominance in the South and in the West. The election of 1818 then demonstrated this Republican power. Republicans outnumbered Federalists 37 to 7 in the Senate and 156 to 27 in the House. Despite the Federalists' demise, uh, their policies remained very much in evidence because of John Marshall's long tenure on the Supreme Court. The issue of national versus states' rights framed debate during his tenure. Marshall was a committed Federalist who shaped the evolution of the Constitution through three principles that formed the basis of his jurisprudence. Uh, first, a commitment to judicial authority, uh, then the supremacy of national over state legislation, uh, and finally a traditional static view of property rights. After Marshall proclaimed the power of judicial review in Marbury v. Madison, uh, the doctrine evolved slowly. The Supreme Court and state courts used it sparingly and only to overturn state laws that conflicted with constitutional principles. Marshall adopted a loose construction of the Constitution uh, and asserted the dominance of national statutes over state legislation, uh, as evidenced in McCullough v. Maryland in 1819 and Gibbons v. Ogden in 1824. Under Marshall, the Supreme Court construed the Constitution so that it extended protection to the property rights of individuals purchasing state-owned lands, and this is Fletcher v. Peck in 1810 and Dartmouth College v. Woodward in 1819. Uh, Nationalist-minded Republicans won the allegiance of many Federalists uh, in the East, again, while Jeffersonian Republicans won the support of Western farmers and Southern planters. The career of John Quincy Adams is a case in point. Uh, the son of President John Adams, a Federalist, uh, John Quincy Adams joined the Republican Party before the War of 1812. He served two terms as Secretary of State under President James Monroe uh, and played a role in several major treaties signed with foreign governments 
uh, ceding land to the young United States. Although the decline of the Federalists and of party politics uh, prompted observers to dub James Monroe's two terms as president as uh, the era of good feeling, uh, the Republican Party divided into a national faction and a Jeffersonian, or a state-oriented faction. Again, uh, this division in the ranks of the Republican Party would produce a second party system in which national-minded Whigs faced off against state-focused Democrats. Okay, this concludes video lecture number 25. You see your review questions at the bottom. Please read this section very carefully. Uh, there are, again, a lot of moving parts here with these political parties, um, with their ideologies, with their views on how the nation should, be, sh should act domestically and, and with foreign affairs. Again, please read this very carefully um, and continue on with your note-taking and with your study.